we remember uh, Women's History Month. And so we are glad uh, Can we leave us right okay, um, okay. Why we uh, why are we waiting on Pastor Man to come back? I'm, I'm, I'm back. Here you go. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Uh, trying to uh, get that prompt off. Uh, all right. Uh, so uh, Valerie is is there. Uh, my name is Reverend Gregory T. Manning, uh, one of the co-moderators for Justice and Beyond. Please know that Justice and Beyond is not led by one or two people. Although there's always a couple of uh, um, uh, front-facing pe uh, people that. Uh, lead, and you'll see in front of this camera, uh, but there are many behind the scenes that are doing great work and have been uh, for many, many years as we organize and collaborate as a collective together uh, to fight on many fronts, uh, that, that and some of which we'll talk about tonight. So please know that we continue to meet, that our intent and purpose is to make sure, especially that we uh, amplify uh, the voices of, of, of our African descendants, our, our brown and black people in this community and the issues that uh, we're dealing with. And so we wanna make sure too that uh, we add as many as possible to come on board. Um, listen, we, we have a uh, pillars meeting every Tuesday at noon and uh, we'd love for you to join us uh, and be a part of the planning of justice and beyond and the vision casting and deciding what actions we'll move on and what we will do. And so we're glad uh, to, to have you. Please be a part of that. Tuesday noon, the same link that you'll find on this newsletter. Uh, with that said, uh, we're going to move right into our discussion on tonight uh, around uh, advancing social justice issues uh, in this next legislative session that is coming up. Uh, we all need to be in tune uh, to how we can participate and make our voices known. So I'm going to ask that each one of our uh, guests would introduce themselves as I call on you. And then we're going to we're going to hear from Senator Royce DuPlessis uh, first, because I know that he has to leave at about 545. And so we really want to hear his voice and give him a, 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 a little more time. And, and then we'll, we'll hear everybody else, too. But first, I want to have everybody simply introduce yourself and tell us um, what we need to know about your organization and a uh, little about uh, what, what you're passionate about right now as it relates to your organization. So let me call on Miss Alana Odoms. We're so glad that you're here with us tonight. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm so glad to be with you too. Senator Duplessis, it's always a pleasure, sir, to share the spotlight with you, my dear friend. My colleague, Chris Kaiser, it's lovely to see you as well and all of the beautiful people on the line here at Justice and Beyond. I had the pleasure of meeting Miss Betty DeMarco at uh, an event that I participated in uh, for Black History Month uh, with the federal courts. And she was just so lovely and uh, uh, energetic and really uh, kind of just gave me a nice warm hug and I said, you know, this is a this is a lady that I want to know in an organization that I'd like to help support. And um, I have been at the helm of leadership at the ACLU of Louisiana for four years and some change, which is really unbelievable to say. But it's been a beautiful four years, really transformational. And we were a little tiny shop when I uh, first um, came to the organization. We were two staff and now we are 15 staff and continuing to grow. Um, we are the chief protectors of uh, civil rights and civil liberties for all Louisianians. Uh, and we are also an organization that prioritizes uh, racial justice. And we do that by refracting our charge uh, to defend the constitutional rights and civil liberties of all Louisianians by trying to focus on those who are the most vulnerable. Um, it's a principle called targeted universalism, but it, it just basically means we believe by helping the least of these that the most of us will actually have an opportunity for equal justice and freedom. We focus primarily on um, many different issues, but our primary focus areas are police accountability. Uh, we have a beautiful program that uh, helps to support Louisianians who's, who've had their rights violated by police. We filed over 50 lawsuits in the last uh two and a half years, uh, Section 1983 cases. 
We've also done, uh, Chris's team has done some beautiful advocacy with the Department of Justice to compel oversight, federal oversight of the Louisiana State Police. And that is something that we're incredibly proud of. And we're also uh, building out a beautiful organizing arm of our police accountability work, uh, which has looked like pieces of legislation to protect whistleblowers. It will continue to, it will look like many different things, but we care deeply about ensuring that uh, there is accountability for law enforcement who harm people in the state of Louisiana. Uh, we also care very deeply about voting rights. Uh, we were happy to see many of you uh, at the Federal Fifth Circuit Court uh, two Mondays ago uh, to pack the court for the Chisholm uh, voting rights case. We're very concerned about the future of representation in the state of Louisiana, uh, in particular for marginalized communities. And I know uh, our Senator is super concerned about that as well. We continue to be concerned about mass incarceration and the fact that our state, actually our country, you do know this, not just Louisiana, our country is obsessed with incarcerating uh, its citizens. And in Louisiana, we uh, are in an epidemic of mass incarceration. And so we care deeply about reducing those uh, levels because we know that our citizens are in fact our most um, valuable resource. And that if we invest in people, not prisons, we actually have an opportunity to change the landscape of the state and country. Um, there are other things that we do. Uh, when Chris introduces himself, I'm sure he'll share some of those things. But I just want to say I'm super grateful to be here with you and really thank uh, thank all of you for your participation and your attention. Thank you, Alana. We appreciate you being here and thank you for that introduction. Uh, let's move to Chris. Chris, uh, tell us uh, a little bit about yourself and about what you're working on. Thank you, Reverend. And thank you all so much for, for having me here tonight. Um, as, as Alana said, we are ramping up and getting ready for a legislative session. So I was really excited to hear this conversation was going on. Um, I head up our advocacy department and that basically means all our public policy work, including our legislative work. Um, just a little about me so you know, I, I spent about 10 or 11 years before I came to the ACLU working on uh, sexual assault survivor advocacy. And so when we're talking about this criminal law reform issue, um, I've seen it from both sides, and, and I, I can tell you for sure that public safety isn't just about long incarcerations or, or a lot of time in jail or, or being punitive. We have to see it uh, from, from both sides. And so, um, as Alana said, um, we, we care deeply about mass incarceration and police accountability. Also at the Capitol, we'll, we focus a lot on voting rights and free speech, gender justice, but we're doing this all through a lens of advancing racial justice. And so I think this is just a beautiful place to, to have this conversation and, and talk about all the intersections. But I will tell you um, at the top, uh, we do anticipate this legislative session, what's gonna happen in about three weeks, uh, crime uh, and, and incarceration is gonna be a major issue and a major uh, issue of debate. Um, so I think all of us together need to be ready to engage in that process. and. Um, you know, especially those of us in New Orleans, not let folks use our city and what's happening in our neighborhoods justify uh, uh, continuing to build and rebuild the system of mass incarceration that we've seen happen in this country and this state for decades. Um, uh, I'll leave it at that from there, but I think there's plenty to talk about. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Chris. Uh, let's move to Deborah Chapman from A Community Voice. Miss Deborah, how are you? Good evening, doing just fine, thank you. All As right. you say, my name is Deborah Campbell and I'm with A Community Voice, this Louisiana nonprofit community organization of, by, and for low income and moderate income people, the working poor, and its headquarters is here in New Orleans. We are affiliated with internationally with ACORN and nationally with A2, the environmental justice organization. As a part of Justice and Beyond, we're also a part of Coalition Against Death Alley here in South Louisiana. We work with grassroots and other groups who have common grounds with us. We have been meeting weekly since the pandemic beginning by conference call in our general membership meetings where we are able to move campaigns and issues. Right now, our main issue is contraflow. We just had and one year anniversary of a tornado. We're asking for sirens in the area and we're asking for monies or funding for a study so that they can figure out evacuate lanes and apply for funding for sirens. 
Um, ContraFlow hasn't been used since 2008. We've got the ball rolling. We've got some classes being held that's going to uh, support the use of ContraFlow. And thanks to Representative Matt Willard and Senator Royce DuPlessis, they've come to our aid and Matt, had, Matt Willard has introduced this uh, to the legislature. We're hoping that we will get funding. We're hoping that we can move forward with this soon and have it in place before hurricane season. All right, thank you, Ms. Deborah. I'm, I'm sorry I called you by my other friend. I'll uh, give you the last name Chapman, but I know you yeah. can. Yeah, <laughs> I know you're talking about. <laughs> All right. It's good to see you tonight. Thanks for being here. Thank you, thank you. Senator Duplessis, welcome. Is the senator here yet? Hey, Reverend, sorry. I was uh, just trying to unmute myself. Good evening to everybody here at Justice and Beyond. I'm, I'm very appreciative for the invitation to be on this evening to talk about this upcoming legislative session, uh, particularly through the lens of social justice. Uh, I think all of you, all of us rather, are based in New Orleans and everybody who has any level of familiarity with what takes place up at the Capitol with respect to social justice. We know there's oftentimes the, the attempts to play offense, but we're, we're mostly playing defense. And uh, I'm happy to kind of give a, give a broad overview of what I think this upcoming session is, gonna, is going to entail. I'm just sorry that I have to do it from my, my car. I'm actually here at Dillard University. I just spoke on a panel to some students about voting and the importance of it. And uh, I, have, I, have a, I do have a hard stop but but I'm, I'm, I'm excited about this conversation this evening. Just a few quick points. It is a fiscal session, as you all may or may not know. And what that means is every other year, the legislature has a fiscal session. This is in the Constitution. Odd number of years are fiscal sessions, which means that every legislator is limited to five non-fiscal bills, general bills that they can file. And the, the idea behind that is that we focus on tax issues. So that'll be a big issue. And we may not talk about this enough, but tax policy is also a social justice policy. Uh, how, we, how we manage our state budget is a social justice matter. And uh, I'm gonna be looking at some legislation and, and trying to file some legislation that is involved with tax policy, but but specifically, I think the top issue this legislative session is going to be around homeowners insurance and trying to make Louisiana a state that companies can do business. We have viable companies, not fly-by-night companies, but actual companies that are solvent, that have the proper reserves, that can write policies to homeowners at rates that are affordable because people are being pushed out of this state. People are being pushed out of the city. And in addition to the skyrocket affordable housing, insurance play into that because those costs end up getting passed down to renters. Those costs end up getting passed down to uh, the most vulnerable in our community. So all of that is very much tied together. It was mentioned earlier, uh, the attempts to undo the, the Chisholm case and that that matter is is incredibly important so we are still waiting for the u.s supreme court to rule on the alabama case as it relates to the congressional districts but i want everybody to be very aware of the fact that while we went into a redistricting session last year uh 2022 we did not take up the supreme court maps and that's still very much out there and there are conversations that are beginning to happen around redistricting for the Supreme Court. At the Supreme Court, you have uh, seven seats and they don't operate by the same uh, requirements of one man, one vote that you do under congressional seats, but it's still very disproportionate when you look at the makeup of the Supreme Court in Louisiana in comparison to that of the rest of the state. It's actually worse than our congressional maps because the, the congressional maps, you have uh, one of six 
the state Supreme Court, you have one of seven. So it's, it's, it's even, it's even a, a more disproportionate representation of our state. So it's important that if there's any legislation filed this session, which I think there will be, that we get it right. And um, I just want Justice and Beyond to be aware of that, that we are still very much in this, in this fight. Um, I mean, there are a multitude of issues. I think Chris and Alana touched on them, Chris in particular, when we talk about the issue of mass incarceration and how we got there to begin with, that the, the, the news reporting and the conversations that are happening around crime in our communities, particularly in New Orleans, has certainly led to the filing of more bills that are focused on increased punishment and increasing uh, the punitive outcomes that, that we have on the books. And, and also keep in mind that it is an election year. So uh, appearing tough on crime will play well for many people in their districts in an attempt to get reelected. So that's something that we have to be very uh, careful about and watching to make sure we don't go down the same road that we've been down. As Alana well knows, she was very involved in the 2017 uh, justice reinvestment package that was passed to try to get us away from the almost $1 billion we're spending annually to lock people up, but we're still not any safer as a result. So we have to, to stand firm in that and, and, and not go back to those old ways of just the reactionary, um, let's just increase penalties as though that's ever been a deterrent. Uh, there's no evidence to suggest that that's the case. We all wanna be safe, but we know that there are smarter ways for us to achieve safety and that's through building healthier communities, uh, education and job opportunities and housing, better housing policies will lead to safety in our communities. Uh, not, not saying that we're gonna um, you know, come with these ridiculous uh, laws that are being proposed. So, um, you know, I, I could I could go on. Uh, like I said, my, much of my focus this upcoming legislative session will be around issues of uh, homeowners insurance. I've also begun the the process of trying to get the state to think about how we deal with this issue of poverty. Last year, I brought a piece of legislation that directed the Department of Health and uh, the Department of Children and Family Services to study the feasibility around creating what's known as a baby bonds program. And this is something that's been talked about at the federal level, but we have not really seen much of it at the state level, although some states are starting to visit this, that poverty, it, it continues to plague our state. And I believe that as, as Alana said earlier, if we invest in people, we can, we can do so much more. And the, the concept behind the baby bonds program would be that we, we basically create a trust for every child that's born into poverty. And that's usually measured by whether or not their, their, their mother's on medic qualifies for Medicaid. And we determine an amount, say, for example, $2,000, $1,500, $3,000. And we put that money in a trust that when that, that child turns 18, they then have the option of using those funds which will have matured or which will have been invested by the state they can use that money to purchase a home in Louisiana, use it for education in Louisiana, or start a business in Louisiana. I think that makes a lot of sense. And because you have that 18 year waiting period, it's not like, you can't call it a handout, right? Which, uh, which people tend to uh, try to do anytime you're talking about a social, uh, social program or investing in people. So uh, that's something that I'm trying to challenge my colleagues to think, to think about because we, I just got the report back and that's something that I'm looking at maybe filing some legislation on as well. Uh, but in terms of other pieces of social justice, we will absolutely be fighting against any attempts to limit uh, a young person's ability or their family's ability to uh, identify how, themselves, however they identify themselves and be free in their own um, identity, period. Uh, you know, there's a whole lot of national debate uh, around pronouns and, and, and what people can or can't refer to themselves as. So we're gonna be fighting against that legislation to, 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 to make sure that kids don't feel attacked because um, you know, we, we need to be trying to lift up our kids, especially our most vulnerable kids. So um, I know I'm kind of jumping from subject to subject, but uh, I'm, you know, I'm just, uh, just trying to hit the issues that are coming to mind. So I'll bring my comments to a close and, and, and turn it back over to you, Reverend. 
Yeah, I, uh, very good. Th thank you, Royce. You gave us a wealth of information. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just going to bounce this back to our other guests and, and see what their reaction to those oh. things. And I know I got about 20 more in, minutes. With yeah. In addition to, I, I forgot to mention, uh, and Ms. Campbell had, had touched on it already, that issue of uh, contraflow and sirens in our communities, which we lack right now, is huge. And I want to thank a community voice publicly for their leadership on this issue. It's not, it's not something that gets talked about, but it is something that's literally uh, could potentially save lives. If, we, if, if And if we have to act as a state, we really do have, this is a crucial issue that we have to act on as a state. And if you sit in one of the meetings and I, and I have to also give a lot of credit to Matthew Willard, Representative Willard, because he has really been the, been the leader on this. I, I've been playing more of a support role, but when you think about the decision or decisions, whether or not to evacuate, you have to understand the socioeconomic components of that, that when you make, when you pull that trigger and say, you're gonna evacuate your parish, that there may be forces and likely are forces that say, no, we don't wanna take that risk because we need people here. Or we need people back here by a certain time to do X, Y, and Z. And that, that's a real, th these are real factors that, that play into, that I believe play into the decision whether or not to evacuate. And, and it's not always about safety. Uh, and I don't wanna diminish, I don't wanna diminish the significance of that decision because it is a huge decision to have to make. But we right now are not prepared and we are not doing what we need to do as a state to, um, to be prepared when we've seen an increase in hurricanes and we've seen an increase in tornadoes. So anyhow, um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you, Senator DuPlessis. I'm gonna bounce it back to, to our other uh, guests in just a moment. But I, I got, I, this question, it just comes from me and my heart. Uh, you know, you talk about the eradication of, of, of poverty and addressing that. Within the, the state house, how much, what is the climate for legislators understanding that in order to really tackle crime uh, and, 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 and really make a difference within our communities uh, that we first have to start by eradicating poverty? Is there, is there, is, is the climate for that shifting in any way for you working with your colleagues to under getting that, getting that point across to them? You know, there are conversations that happen during the legislative process and then there are conversations that that happen outside of the process when when people I think are being a little bit more honest sometimes and I think there is a, a disconnect where people who come from communities where there may not be the the same level of crime occurrences whether it's property crime whether it's uh victim involved crime, if they're not happening at the same percentages in those communities, they don't really understand or show a willingness to want to understand what is leading to crime happening in communities. And I think it, 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 it also, the, the fact that you have associations that are, are so, so strong at the state capitol, organizations like the Sheriff's Association, the DA's Association, uh, and others, that, that plays such a strong role in that debate around law enforcement policies, it, it, it makes it difficult to have the conversation, like you said, around poverty. And if we're, if we're serious about dealing with the issue of crime, then we need to talk about that as a symptom and not as uh, anything else. That crime is a symptom and we need to be focused on the root cause which again, justice reinvestment was supposed to be about. We take the savings from not incarcerating as many folks, particularly nonviolent offenders, and then reinvesting into preventative services, reentry services, housing to try to reduce crime. So I think we saw some at the beginning of the, the, um, the term of, of John Bell was his governor, uh, Governor John Bell was his first term. And I think that's a combination of things, but but just like any other initiative, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about this gun gun violence reduction in the city and our commitment to 
being behind programs that are actually going to stand the test of time, it takes commitment. You know, it, it takes under, accepting that this is not a perfect process. It takes long-term commitment that outlasts a four-year term or an eight-year term. So uh, I think we saw some of it, some of an appetite, but not, you know, I'm, I'm starting to see it wane a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for that, that answer. Uh, uh, Senator, would you give us, give the people, if you can, in the chat, uh, the email that they can get a hold of you because I, I may or may not get to too many questions for you uh, with your time constraint, but give that to them, please, uh, so that they can ask those questions directly. I need to get to the uh, other guests, but thank you so yeah. much. I'll try to get back to you. I'm gonna go ahead and try to. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and try to type it in there, uh, Reverend. I'm gonna type my 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 email address in there. Is that okay? Yeah, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Good to see you, brother. Uh, and, and I'm trying to Got get it. back. To you, but I want to ask all of. Uh, let, let's start with with uh, Alana. Um, give us uh, any any reactions you have to what Senator Duplessis has just said, and what what that kind of prompts in your mind in terms of what you're working on and the connection between it. Sure. Well, as the senator uh, articulated, when it comes to uh, criminal legal reform, we're really going to be uh, seeing folks use fear uh, and um, hatred, actually, as a way to galvanize folks to go back to um, policies that we know are incredibly harmful uh, to community and also uh, particularly expensive and not based in, in, in any evidence uh, and merely, you know, usually just based in retribution. And so it is very hard when you're facing the headwind of such, um, you know, crime being reported daily uh, in the newspapers, uh, daily as the headlines uh, on the news, and also, frankly, uh, feeling the personal, I think, impact that usually touches most of us, which is property crime. Uh, I'm sure many of us have, have experienced that. And one of the things that one of my mentors told me is that we cannot and should not allow our pain to dictate our politics, right? And, and so when, when we talk about wanting to be safe, everybody wants to be safe. I, I live uh, alone with an eight-year-old daughter. And so when I think about going home at night and being safe, it is of the utmost paramount concern for me to be safe in my home and be safe in my community. So I say that full-throated without any caveat or exception. And yet I also say, I've also heard people describe themselves as the victims of violent crime when their cars have been broken into. And so I'll, I'll also say that, um, you know, we, we, have, we have a system that is largely, the criminal legal system is one that is born out of a very painful but very significant history in this country. One that we really very rarely want to uh, reconcile with, which is our history of slavery. And the history of slavery and its vestiges, which include um, convict leasing, which include Jim Crow segregation, and which also uh, involve the birth of mass incarceration and the many myriad ways that we continue to try to extract labor uh, from people who are essentially the former descendants of enslaved people is really phenomenal. And I'll, I'll just point out a statistic here that in the South, the former 13 former states of the Confederacy, well, we are the top 10 states in incarceration in the nation. That is not a mistake. That is not by accident. That is by design. And uh, we know this because uh, when we kind of go back, for example, and you look at the records from uh, the Constitutional Convention of 1898, where you're seeing, you know, the impact that Reconstruction had, and then the kind of virulent backlash that you saw of, of, of essentially white folks trying to regain control over politics, but also 
um, money, and also the narrative of the way this country kind of tells the story of itself. Uh, you see laws like um, the non-unanimous jury provision, which we, uh, you know, the senator worked on, some other colleagues on this uh, on the line and community members worked on, uh, where folks are specifically talking about um, ingraining and building a foundation to support white supremacy into perpetuity. And what does that mean? That means that what we had during slavery is you had 150 years essentially of labor that was was completely free and and we know that there are you know dozens if not myriad um banks that were built during that time period including many significant you know national institutions like jp morgan chase and others we know that railroad companies were built during that time I just got back from South Carolina visiting with a really beautiful family who built uh, a, a cotton mills and a beautiful, a, a huge burgeoning business that sells sheets. And they had a monopoly on sheet production in the United States for uh, almost 100 years. All of this came from 150 years of having enslaved people provide labor. So what kind of business could you have if you have no personnel costs? <laughs> And, and honestly, when that, the, the prospect of that went away, there were lots of attempts to figure out how can we criminalize um, as, as much as we can by way of behaviors that we can actually create a, a, an opportunity where folks fit into the exemption, the exception clause of the 13th Amendment, which is if you are a convicted criminal, you can be um, subject to enslavement or slave labor. And so we see lots of different ways that, uh, you know, you see the birth of modern day policing with our, with with slave patrols, which, which uh, you know, if state laws empowered any person to be able to attack and surveil uh, black people that they thought were escaping so that they could be reclaimed and that they could their labor could be uh, could be utilized again. And so, you know, we have a lot of scholars who've written about this arc of slavery to mass incarceration. But you you see that if you go back and just look at a little bit of the history and you look at where we are now, there is really a very direct line mm -hmm. from this history of of slavery and and frankly just um, making the color black and the culture black and brown uh, synonymous with guilt and also synonymous with with danger. And yes. and so one, one thing that I want to say, you know, hopefully this will be a, an opportunity for us to have a dialogue. And I want to I want to share the history with you because I think it's important because a lot of times folks want to tell you about what what you're seeing today, but they don't want to talk to you about the history primarily because they don't know the history, but even if so, they don't want to take um, accountability or responsibility for knowing the history. Um, but I'll tell you this, what we worked on in 2017, and we studied this for a couple of years, some really amazing researchers out of uh, Washington, DC, and a lot of local folks who participated on this, um, analyzed all of our criminal statutes. And number one, they said we have far too many. We have something like 600, 650, um, unique criminal statutes that criminalize everything from taking somebody's crawfish to taking somebody's cattle to taking somebody. I mean, there's about 50 different theft statutes. There's all kinds of redundancy in our criminal codes. But that's not that's also by design. Mm -hmm. Right. It's by design that there's so many that you can you have your, you know, your crime du jour so that you can, you know, have an opportunity to uh, incarcerate more people. Um, but we also know that in Louisiana, we incarcerate and always have more of our citizens for low level nonviolent offenses, most of which are <clears throat> drug possession and low level property crimes, not involving crimes of violence, more than any other place in the country, more right. than our Southern neighbors, more than our deep, deep Southern neighbors who are, are as conservative, if not more conservative than Louisiana, South Carolina, Georgia, Arkansas, Texas. We, we, we lock up our citizens more than any of those people. And so it begs the question, 
do we have citizens in Louisiana who are simply more sinister and more dangerous than anybody else in the world? Absolutely. No, what we know is that these are policy choices. Policy drives our uh, the, the length of our sentences and the ways in which our legislators are permitted to introduce legislation. And, and what we found is that a lot of the legislation introduced was not based on evidence and not, not based on any real science of what actually helps to keep people safe, but rather um, anecdote, you know, uh, stories, uh, deep feelings of fear and anger, pain that people have. And so I'll go back to that statement around not letting our pain dictate our policy. I'm not suggesting that we need to minimize the pain of any crime survivor or anyone who's experienced violence or harm. That is the furthest that I can say from the from what I am suggesting. But what I am also saying is that if we use that pain and that anger and that fear and that retribution to guide our policy decisions, we end up in a very, very dangerous place, a very circular place where we are feeding a beast that is one that will never be satiated by yeah. what we are offering. Because what we are offering is human beings, many of whom are children, to be devoured by a system which will only impact them and create, inflict more harm and more trauma. And the way I'll, I'll close is to say, um, if any caretaker or any uh, parent or, or family member on the line who's had to care for loved ones, um, we know this to be a, a, a universal law about human beings. When you invest in human beings with patience and love and kindness and empathy, you are able to create transformational change in a human being, especially in children. Uh, but that actually is a, it's actually a, a universal human law for everyone. It's not just for children, because it's important to you know, hear people say, okay, well, yes, we should have second chances for children, but everybody else, let's get rid of them. Um, if you if you ever have the opportunity, and you probably won't right now because the Department of Corrections is being investigated by the Department of Justice for holding people over their sentences, holding people longer than their time to be incarcerated, which they've been doing for decades. But if you've ever had the chance to walk the halls of Angola or visit the long-term care facility there, you know that there are, I think we have 6,000 people serving, close to 6,000 people serving life in prison without parole in Louisiana. Many of those people are hospice care workers who are caring for infirmed um, colleagues that are um, that are at the state penitentiary facility. Many folks are actually providing um, care and groundskeeping, cooking, and other services at the governor's mansion. Many people provide those same services and uh, care at the uh, Department of Corrections headquarters. Many of those folks are providing, are doing farming and uh, firefighting and uh, groundskeeping and landscaping and motor vehicle services and all of these things that are profitable, incredibly profitable, and they're doing it in a safe way because undoubtedly we wouldn't have folks at the legislature, and I'll call attention to that, and the senator knows this to be true, that there are hundreds of incarcerated people working at the Capitol, cooking and cleaning and taking care of grounds. And they are kind of seamlessly kind of camouflaged into the, the patchwork of, you know, colorful folks that come into that building, but they are not in chains. They are not in shackles. They are trusted. They are working and they are serving and taking care of the people of the state of Louisiana. And so I ask you to just think about um, what is it all for? What are we trying to accomplish by keeping a certain population in a stranglehold. And if Absolutely. we know that that is a financial incentive and we know that it is also something that deeply compromises our power of creativity and future uh, innovation and safety, what are we willing to do to change that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alana. And, and just, you know, as you mentioned, those uh, 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 incarcerated folks that are, are serving in, in the Capitol, but yet not getting compensated for it in such a way that it can build any sort of 
generational wealth uh, for them or their families. Uh, that's the atrocity as well too, right? Precisely. And, um, you know, we we just know that that's not an issue of public safety. If it were an issue of public safety, folks would not be permitted to uh, be free, but yeah. their their labor is free. And we wrote a really uh, fantastic report in um, in conjunction with our national office on prison labor and how exploitative it is. And that, you know, most people start out in the fields in, uh, in Louisiana State Penitentiary making two to three cents an hour. If they refuse to work in the fields, they are um, punished with solitary confinement. And um, they're, they're, they're not compensated and they are also not protected with labor laws, right? They're exactly the same as you and I. The only difference is there are no labor laws to protect them. There are no wage protections. There, there are no union protections. There's nothing that they can do if they are harmed, if they are not paid, if they are become ill while working, all of those things. And Chris just put the uh, report in the chat. Thank you so much, captive labor. Uh, but yes, you're exactly right. No difference between you and I and incarcerated folks who are working, just the absence of protections and human dignity. Wow. Thank you. you. You said a lot, and, and I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, and I'm sure there'll be some questions for you when we move to questions. Thank you, Alana. I, I, I'm going to move over uh, to Deborah Campbell uh, and, and get her thoughts, especially on uh, what the senator said about counter, uh, Contraflow and what we need to know about what a community voice is working on as concerns Contraflow. What do, what do you want to tell us, uh, Ms. Deborah? All right. Right now, we're working with uh, different uh, departments, head departments of the state and the city. You know, our first meeting we had with them, it was almost like, uh, there's no need for this. But as we meet with them and continue meeting with them, they're jumping on board. They're finding a need for it. Right now, they've started some kind of training so that contraflow can be put back into place because what happened since 2008, that was the last time they used ContraFlow. No one on staff is familiar with ContraFlow. Mm. So now we have to make it familiar to them again. So they have decided to do some sort of training. Another thing we're looking at is Evaculanes. Evaculanes is merely extra wide shoulders. When we go on our own to evacuate, we use them as lanes. And now we're asking them to control it, let it come into play, find a way where we won't bottleneck in a certain area. Once they put these uh, evacuates into place, we should be able to have a straight flow out of the city. Um, that's another thing we brought to the table. Sirens. We just had one year anniversary of the tornado in our Araby, where we lost a gentleman, his life was lost out there. And we're asking for sirens. We need some type of warning to let us know that we are in danger, our area is in danger, and to take heed. If you're not near a telephone or a radio it, or a TV, if you're coming home from work and you don't, you don't know what's happening. So that's why we're asking for these sirens to come into play. Um, we're also bound by whether the mayor or the governor will have political will to actually call a mandatory evacuation. So we're working on what to do about that and how to get these mandatory evacuations put into place. We're gonna work with the weather uh, control people and see if there's anything they can come up with where we can give them a time frame for our uh, doing ContraFlow. Right now, we do have something in place, a little time frame in place, but these tornado, these uh, hurricanes are coming much stronger, much faster, where we may need more time. But just like uh, Senator Royce Duplessis hinted on is that it's a power play. You have businesses that don't want ContraFlow put into place because it would take their people away from the jobs. It would mm. cost them maybe some money, but in return, it's costing us our lives. So we're asking for some of this to be eliminated 
and let this program go through. Um, we are having a meeting. We'd love for everyone to join the meeting. It's a ContraFlow meeting by phone and it's Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Please take down this number. The number is 504-294-4472. That's 504-294-4472. Wednesday, 10 a.m. Please, please join us. The more people we have that will attach to this problem, the quicker we can get it resolved. And that's what's happening at this time with contraflow and sirens and evacuating. We'll take that. We just need to get our people safe out of New Orleans whenever the hurricane or the surrounding areas, whenever the hurricane is coming. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Deborah. Thank you so much for highlighting those issues. It always comes back to economics and, and, and money, doesn't it? Uh, folk don't want to keep people safe because they're afraid of it impacting their businesses when, when people are dying, as you said. That's uh, right. Thank, thank you for, for making that clear. You know, I had to point out, they don't want to close the, the side of the interstate that's coming towards town because mm -hmm. they may need uh, emergency vehicles to come in. Uh, you know, for the number of people that need to get out, compared to the number of emergency vehicles that need to get in, public, uh, the, the, the electrician people aren't coming until the hurricane, after the hurricane hit. Right, right. They're not trying to get into the storm, so let us out. You know, right, let right. us have this thoroughfare to get out and bring the emergency people through. They can do a Highway 90. Right. They can do the levee, come yeah. through the levee to New Orleans. But don't block us from getting out to let these people come in. And everybody Ms. should be leaving. Right. They shouldn't Mr. Have anybody coming in. When people want to advocate, when they get on this call and they want to advocate, what is the 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 the, the best argument or case they can make uh in, to, to restate counter flow? What 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 if they if they want to be the, the most persuasive? What what saving what, lives saving mm -hmm. lives, get us out of harm's way. Please, we've got elderly, we've got nursing homes. Mm -hmm. We need to get those people out, get mm -hmm. them to safety. Um, disabled, we need to get them out. Another thing, we need to advertise within the city what to do if you're disabled and where to go to get out of here. Right. It's not enough. We're not giving out enough information. I find. Yeah, you are right. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. So that's where we're at. And if you can touch on either one of those subjects, yeah. jump on it, jump on yeah. it. Thank you. The, the marginalized, the dis, dis, uh, disabled, the elderly, uh, oh. the are going to be most vulnerable in this situation. Let me ask you, what as we look at states and uh, around us, are, are there other states that are doing this differently that we can point to and say, well, look, look what they're doing? Smooth sailing. That's what we're looking at. The evacuations is being uh, done in Florida. Mm. They're getting out. They're getting their people out. And they have a lot of population just like we do. Right. So right. that's what we're trying to look at, where the yeah. population is, what they're doing, how quickly. I'm, I'm told some one of the Carolinas, they can get their country flow in, in within just a few hours mm. and get it done and, and organized. Right. Us, we're saying, oh, it takes days. We've got to see if this one is available. We've got to see if Mississippi can do. And I, I grant you, it closes off the interstate for different states. Yes, it does. But there's other ways that they can use while we're trying to get out of here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The state is not the only exit or entrance for them. Yes. So Are that's you, where we're at. Uh, Ms. Deborah, if you would, if you want to put in the chat too, we'd appreciate it. Uh, what is that oh. telephone number that we need to get on that call with? That's 10 o'clock Wednesday morning, 504-294- Four four seven two. All right, all right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for everything. 
And please stay on the, on the line. We're going to have some questions in just a, a little bit. All right. This okay. is an incredible conversation and uh, making us aware of those things that we need to focus and tune into uh, in order to really be about social justice, which is about making sure that people are treated with fairness and not marginalized. Yeah. Uh, as we see this so often being done uh, in our state and in our community. Uh, Chris, um, jump in here. I'm sorry that I haven't given you a lot of attention on, on this. There's so much to be said. Um, you, I want you to jump in and give us your thoughts on what's been said and, 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 and what what we need to know about what you're working on. Yeah, um, th thank you, first of all, Reverend. Um, I, I, wanna, I wanna echo a couple of things that we heard both from Senator DuPlessis and from Alana. Um, you know, Senator DuPlessis mentioned that some of these conversations around incarceration and responses to crime are, are reactionary, they're fear-driven, um, and they're reminiscent of a lot of the discourse that led to mass incarceration in the first place. Um, two of the most significant drivers in making Louisiana the incarceration capital of the world and the US the incarceration capital of the world were first, the decision to treat drugs and substance abuse as a criminal matter rather than a public health matter first and foremost. And second, letting sentencing decisions, long sentences above 10, 20, 30 years, be driven purely by a person's criminal history rather than how much of a risk this individual actually is to the community. Things like mandatory minimums, three strike laws, habitual offender statute here, here in Louisiana. So, you know, in 2017, when we did that justice reinvestment process, we had the beginning of a conversation to try to reverse that. Let's, let's think about what actually we could be spending the money on rather than long-term incarceration, how can we reinvest in the communities? But fast forward a few years now, and, and we only have a fraction of the bills filed or pre-filed so far for this legislative session, what we're seeing already are, guess what? Mandatory minimums for things like drug possession, mandatory minimums for a whole panoply of different types of offenses, um, reducing people's opportunities for good time credits to maybe be released early if they if they exhibit good behavior and rehabilitation. All the things that set up the exact wrong incentives to get us out of the mess that we're in. We're, we're backsliding exactly toward that, or at least some folks at the Capitol are, are trying to make us backslide. So I guess I would just highlight one thing that Senator DuPlessis also said too, was about the influential political forces that happen at the Capitol. Um, in a time like this where we're, don't get me wrong, there are absolutely legitimate concerns about crime and violence here in New Orleans and across the state, but that's when the time is right for a lot of these folks who would like to roll back these reforms any day of the week, any year, but this is the time when they feel like they have the opportunity to play on everybody's fear. That is compounded by the fact that we just went through this redistricting cycle that kind of stacks the deck against, against folks because our representation isn't what it should be at the state level. And so all those things combined make for a really dangerous time for us to go right back to what we've been doing for the, the second half of the 20th century and create the, the, the largest mass incarceration apparatus that the world's ever seen. And I guess I would just leave it with this, because we know we're outnumbered and because we know we're dealing with gerrymandered electoral districts across the state, it's all the more important that people like folks on this call, especially people in New Orleans who who all this is being done in the names of, really speak out and, and dissent. If, if we don't believe in that, if we don't think that's what is going to produce safety for our communities, they need to hear it. And not just not just the opposition, but the folks who are fighting our behalf. Senator Duplessis and the rest of the Orleans delegation need to hear that from us too, because they're under pressure to, to you know, do something about the crime that we all see around us. And they need to know that there's an alternative vision for what safety can mean. So I, I guess that's you know our general call. We all need to be engaged in this. And, and I, I can't speak for anybody else, but I can tell you that the ACLU of Louisiana is gonna be tracking every one of these bills and you can stay in touch with us and we'll keep you apprised of, of what's actually getting momentum and how you can help fight against it. Thank you, Chris. I um, uh, appreciate those words. Give us uh, the best way to keep in touch with you all. I'll put our website in the tab. I think honestly, that's that's the simplest thing. You can sign up for updates. Then, you, and when we have, uh, it's it's game time basically. That we know a committee hearing is coming up, and you, they need to hear from us. You'll get that blast from us. Um, and I, and I'll also put in a plug. I know I know a lot of folks are local here in New Orleans, but on April fourteenth, 
we're going to be holding a symposium up at Southern University Law Center in Baton Rouge to talk about this issue too. Um, we're going to try to, it's the first week of legislative session. A lot of stuff won't be happening yet, but we're going to be on the cusp of it. We're going to have an, an in-depth conversation with the community and some, uh, you know, I saw in the chat, folks were talking about our conservative allies. We're going to bring the, them in too and figure out what, what's the way forward. Okay, very good. Let me ask you and Alana too, is there a possibility, I know that uh, the, the the bill that would uh, take away the exemption for the 13th Amendment uh, and continue enslavement uh, did not pass. Uh, and, and, and from what I heard, the author of the bill uh, did not suggest that it would pass. He, he, he uh, came back and said it was not written correctly, uh, as far as I understand. Is there an opportunity for us to see another bill like that anytime soon? What I heard from Representative Jordan, who, who, who fought hard for it last session and, and I think uh, uh, is committed to the issue, I, I've heard that he, he would like to bring it back. Um, it hasn't been pre-filed yet, but it's absolutely something that we're keeping our eyes on. Um, you know, for the reasons that Alana laid out when she was talking about the captive labor report, it's, it's an immensely uh, uh, huge problem in Louisiana, and we're, we're behind him if he brings it. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> let's move to some questions that I, I'm sure a lot of people have uh, tonight. And so uh, I'm going to ask uh, either Brooke or Kiana, if you're, you're on, could y'all help with the questions? Because I think Valerie, who usually uh, helps on, on this half, is not here. So would one of y'all do that? Brooke? Yes, I'm yeah. just unmuting oh. myself here as I... <laughs> Um, let's see, we have, um, let's see. sorry, um, let's see, sorry, I just Is asked there, you. Uh, yeah, uh, Jeff Connor wanted to know if there's much um, much momentum, I guess, on intentionality for not knowing the history and to stop the teaching of history. Is that going to be something that we're going to see? Uh, um, mm. And will they, I guess with all of these things, are they going to tie it to something financial? <clears throat> good, good question. Uh, Alana or, or Chris, uh, do you know? Um, are we going to see a, a climate like there uh, that there's been in Florida uh, that's going to impact what's being we taught in the classroom as far as the, the history of predominantly African descendants? So I'll, I'll defer to Chris on whether or not we'll see any CRT type um, legislation or anti CRT type legislation introduced. But I'll say this. I have an eight year old. And um, we don't live in Florida, but looking at the curriculum and what is introduced, what is being taught in her school, <laughs> um, in the social studies curriculum in particular, is not very far off from what is happening in Georgia. And, and you know, I've been having ongoing conversations with her school about the importance of uh, teaching an accurate and full inclusive history. And you know, you would be shocked to know the things that our children are being taught, that enslaved people were happy, they enjoyed free time, that they were able to buy and uh, sell goods and trade. I mean, it's just shocking things that you would just, it, it feels very much uh, as though, you know, what gets headlines, of course, is when you have a, an elected official kind of make these very staunch kind of um, edicts around what will not be taught and what will not be allowed and legislation that's going to be introduced. But the thing that scares me most of all is that with, with the potential of Republican leadership in our governor's mansion, um, you know, next year, we're not far off from what is happening, to be very honest. And, uh, you know, in, in some of the, the most extreme places like in Florida and, with the governor and with the, the school board and um, 
others who kind of shape the curriculum. Like we are, we're, we're in a very dangerous place as it stands and we could potentially be going much further, I think, uh, in the wrong direction. And so, um, you know, I think it's important for folks to know when we talk about, you know, voting in our gubernatorial elections, when we talk about, you know, what, how important a specific role is, there are a lot of things that we think about, you know, but one of the things that we really need to be focused on is, you know, with, with regard to this next election, of course, is about criminal legal reform. And if we will kind of start wasting our taxpayer dollars again to go back to a, an old system of of harm that we know doesn't work, but also how we'll be educating our children and what they'll actually be able to learn in the state of Louisiana is huge. Uh, we're in the process of working on a very detailed memorandum to provide um, information and tools and resources to our community about the book bans that have been happening all across Louisiana with the libraries. That's actually, you know, we're something that we are really proud of and, and will kind of be a digest, a guide for folks to kind of go through and understand your rights. Um, but, you know, we've already seen that kind of censorship happening in the libraries and the schools, I mean, are, of course, a national extension of that. And as I'm as I'm explaining to you, it's very much happening in the schools already. Very, very much so. Um, you would be surprised to know, though, there's a great deal of discretion that happens at the school level based upon the individual teacher. And so that's, I think, some of the discretion that, you know, doesn't exist in a Florida, for example, that if, for example, if you have a teacher who is very grounded in the history and wants to share that history, Black history, Indigenous history, other history with her students or his students, they're permitted to do that. But by and large, what we see is are just um, teachers that don't have a lot of resources. My child's in a French immersion program, so she's not even being taught by American citizens. She's being taught by folks who are French and who um, are not very well versed in American you know, history, let alone full American history. And um, yeah, so the, the, that, the, those are some real, some real things that we need to be able to fight and stand up against. And so this memo that we're going to be sending out, we will send that directly to you. Um, we're going to be, of course, sending it out to our membership. And we're going to be providing some very clear, I think, guidance around, um, you know, how this is really an infringement on our First Amendment rights. It's content censorship. It's um, it's prior restraint. It's all, it's, it's many, many, in many ways, it's viol violative of our First Amendment rights. And so I'll let Chris talk about the legislation because I'm not exactly sure what folks have up their sleeve, but I, I think we are poised to uh, be in a, a dangerous situation with where we're currently going. Absolutely, absolutely. We could go all the way uh, to, to the right, as it were, if, uh, with this new gubernatorial uh, election. Uh, Chris, um, real quick, just uh, if you want to jump in there, we I know we got a lot of questions, so I can be very brief, but I want to make two points around about the, the rhetoric around that uh, those library censorship bills, because I think a lot is right to make that connection. Thus far, they have been characterized mostly as around um, restricting sexually explicit material and, and books. But what you have to know is what what at least a couple of these bills do so far are set up uh, local government to have more political influence over not only the content of libraries in general, but also the, the the people who are making those content moderation decisions. And so even though they're talking about primarily LGBTQ content and what they're, they're calling sexually explicit material, it sets up a structure at the local government level to exert influence on a whole range of content that, that folks might not like, including uh, things about the history of, of uh, racial oppression and what have you. Um, the other thing, I, I don't know who said it in the chat, but I think it's a great point. Um, they're calling this, this an issue of parents' rights, but you always have to ask which parents? Right. Which parents? The <laughs> parent, the, this, is, this is coming from a very specific interest group and it does not uh, stand for what most parents in the state or the country think about this stuff. And so I, I would just ask you, those of, those of you who are parents uh, uh, watching, don't let us speak for you. That's not what this is. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. And 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 know that you know, in order to get that memo, that ex extremely important memo, 
uh, we need to sign up with that uh, link that was provided to us uh, so that you can become educated and know how to advocate. Um, uh, Brooke, is there another question? Yeah, there are several. Um, the next one is, uh, what can be done about the hundreds of excessive punitive prison sentences in the Louisiana Criminal Code? So what, what can we do as citizens to help push the codes to be changed so that they're not so willy-nilly or whatever, whatever it is. <laughs> Referring back to those 650 unique laws that are on the books? Yes, yes, I think that's what you mean, right, Cece? You're that, muted. That... Yeah, exactly, exactly, okay. because as Alana said, you know, I'm really interested in knowing, I mean, I think there needs to be a study or an investigation of how many of these Civil War era, Reconstruction era laws are still writing the books, just like the non-unanimous jury had wrote the books past 1915 when they were outlawed. And I, I guess they're still in force in Oregon. I don't know. But I'm just saying, we need. what can we do? I, I think somebody needs to do an investigation of the criminal code of Louisiana, because as she said, you know, there's redundancy in the, you know, in these, uh, we have the harshest sentencing that I'm aware of, of any state, even the Southern neighbors, as she said. So I, I, I don't know what we can do, but that, I guess that's a question for Alana yeah. and, and Chris, what can we do? So one of the things that we can do, and I, I wanna kind of clearly point out and thank you all who, have been participating with us in the redistricting process because one of the most important ways we can influence uh, change in the criminal legal system is to actually get some folks in the legislature who are actually willing to listen to their constituency when we go to testify and when we go to raise our voices around uh, the need to reform uh, and to change some of these punitive sentences. I mean, as you know, and Chris can expound on this, but you know, many of our most heinous, most retributive, most um, harmful policies come from those districts that are have been racially gerrymandered to be extremely conservative and majority white. And so, what we've got, we can't take our our attention and eyes off of the voting and the redistricting process because. We can fight as hard as we want to fight. Chris and I can introduce legislation to study the 650 uh, criminal uh, statutes, and we can try and propose uh, probation and parole reform and give people an opportunity at parole at a certain number of years served and all kinds of really, uh, we, can, we can introduce legislation to eliminate mandatory minimums and other things that are not based in evidence and practice. But if we go to the uh, ACJ committee and we can't get the bill actually heard, we can't get it heard. If we can't get it out of committee, we can't get it out of committee. And that's where we are right now. We don't have the votes <laughs> to move anything progressive out of the criminal justice committee. Now we can take other roads and we have, you know, with you know, drafting bills in a way such that we can maybe get them through the Judiciary Committee or we can move them through civil law or we can try and do some other strategies and tactics. But right now we just don't have the votes. And so an increasingly conservative legislative body really does hamstring us in a way that is particularly harmful because as I was talking, Criminal criminal law is policy. It is made at the state house. It is those legislators, state legislators that are in, introducing bills and that are passing them, and that creates the infrastructure of our uh, our criminal legal system in the state. That's it. That's how it gets done. We can occasionally. Uh, bring certain matters before the court uh, on excessive sentences to try and kind of um, get some relief that way. But by and large, the way you make these changes is in the state house, and that's where we're kind of running up against some really difficult, um, uh, you know, difficult challenges. All right, thank you, Alana. 
Um, let me go to the next question, Brooke. Yes. Um, we have, well, the, there was one about, um, there was one about uh, what, what methods um, are most effective to support. And Chris answered with direct calls, emails from people in members' own districts can be very effective. Chris, do you have anything else to add to that? Uh, really quickly, and this, this is related to the point Alana just made, I just wanna uh -huh. explain kind of why, because for all those reasons that, that Alana just described that, that are so disenfranchised through gerrymandering so many other ways, um, a byproduct of that in some districts across the state is that there's widespread disengagement from the public. It is, it is a sad fact that in many areas, our legislators just aren't that used to hearing from a lot of people in their districts, especially on, on issues that affect some of the most marginalized people in the community. And so for that reason, it can be quite effective when they finally do hear from even, even a handful, even a dozen people who are in their district and say, Representative, Senator, this is a priority for your constituents. You need to listen to me. I know that sounds really basic, but in, in a lot of places, it, it really is. Uh, there's not a lot of mobilization. There's not a lot of um, outreach to the members. And it doesn't take maybe as many voices as you might think to make that message stick. And to Senator DuPlessis' point earlier, a lot of folks, maybe they're not criminal justice experts. Maybe they're a business man in, in somewhere else in Louisiana and they don't think about these issues that much. They might not feel very strongly about uh, enacting a lot of new crimes or new punishments, but they'll go along with the political wins if that's the easiest thing. But one of the things we can do is make them hear the alternative view. And if they're hearing that from their constituents, that it can matter, it, it really can matter. So uh, I, I know that that might sound pie in the sky and a little basic, but I, I really do think it's true. <laughs> And I think I thank you for saying that, Chris, because I, what I what I know is that ignorance runs rampant uh, within our legislature, and 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 in the way that a lot of times legislators don't even know what's in bills, uh, and and they just have not familiarized themselves with the nuances of those bills. So they, uh, I, I think it's incumbent on us and very necessary for us to make it clear to them what they have not been able to. Uh, discover for themselves. Good point. Yeah. Um, and this is, I think, is directed to Alana, and that is, um, is there or will there be continued support from the conservative funded lobby in Baton Rouge advocating for decreasing the prison population, Koch Foundation funding? Mm -hmm. hmm. I hope so. Um, <laughs> I I believe so. I think it just depends on what we're talking about. Um, you know, I think we saw quite a bit of support from the right uh, for justice reinvestment. And it's important to note that there was a clear line drawn in the sand very early on in that process that all of the recommendations that the task force made that impacted any crime of violence or uh, dealt in any way with any uh, with any crime of violence was exempted from any of what was going to be introduced by way of legislation, which is kind of how we got to this place where we were um, just looking at a low level nonviolent offenses. Um, if we want to make any significant change in our um, in our rates of incarceration and overall um, population of incarcerated people, we have got to do something about folks who are longest serving. The people that we were speaking about earlier um, who've served 30, 40, 50 or more years in prison because that is an aging population. It's a ballooning population. And um, those numbers are unlike any other numbers in, in other places. I mean, we have the same penalty for first degree and second degree murder in the state of Louisiana. That is not the case in any other state. So that means there's a term of years, for example, in Texas, if someone's convicted of second degree murder, where after serving, say, for example, 30 years, and I'm not sure if it's 30 or 35, but they're eligible for parole. Doesn't mean they will be paroled. It means they are eligible. They have a opportunity at, per, at at a parole hearing. We have no such thing for anyone at any time. 
So I don't know if there will be that broad-based support for looking at parole eligibility, uh, looking at second look legislation, things that will give people an opportunity after having served a certain number of years to have an opportunity to have those um, their sentences reduced, th those more impactful pieces of legislation. I don't know if there will be that support, especially in this political climate. I'm hopeful, but I don't know. All right. Thank you, Alana. Uh, Brooke, uh, is there? Yeah. What can we do to, um, this is from uh, from Gary Watson, what can we do to overcome chronic widespread disengagement? Hi, Gary. Uh, parenthetically, oppression in rural in rural parishes. How can yeah. we, what can we do? Thank well, you. Gary. Yeah, it's a it's a wonderful question, and you know, first first thing I'll say is. There are a few things that we are doing on a very, on the, the scale that we're able to do them. We have a, a really amazing program. Uh, it's the Rural rural Community Advise, um, I'll maybe get the letters wrong, Rural Community Action Table. Did I get it right, Chris? No. RCAT, RCAT. I'll put it okay. in the chat. He'll put it in the chat. I just, I screwed it up. But it is building leaders and organizers in our rural communities. And we largely organize our first, first cohort of leaders uh, around redistricting and voting rights. And I'll say this, disengagement flows more from the fact that people know that the system is rigged rather than the fact that they don't want to be engaged or don't believe that voting is important or don't care as much about their children as others care about theirs. And so, you know, when I think about engagement and how we actually combat um, feelings of um, apathy or um, just, an unwillingness to want to participate in a system that you know is kind of stacked against your favor is that we just have to, we have to keep investing in our communities and we have to keep, I mean, through this program, we actually had a budget for each and every organizer where we actually funded their, their organizing efforts, local community efforts that they were, um, uh, that they had, had kind of worked to implement. And I think, you know, finding ways to restore faith in the system means that we actually have to give, I think, people opportunities to continue to grow their leadership. And we also have to provide, I mean, because, you know, when we look at, for example, like elections, like the last election with Governor Edwards, it, you know, it was largely Black people who helped reelect the governor and many of whom were Black women in of course, in New Orleans and some of our metropolitan areas, but Black people all over the state and women all over the state in rural communities and otherwise. And so I think a lot of it is also remembering, um, I think, our history in terms of the fact that, you know, every movement for civil rights, racial justice, women's rights was powered by a dynamic and usually unseen group of women who were organizing and making certain that, you know, things were happening. And I think putting a focus on women's leadership, especially when it comes to voting and re-engagement is really important because when you engage women, you engage families. When you engage families, you engage communities. And when you engage communities, you engage uh, the larger uh, nation. And so I, I don't think it can be overstated how important women's leadership is going to be to, to helping to kind of um, change the trajectory of, of this country. And so wherever we can do that, wherever we can double down on investing in rural communities, investing in women, inf investing in people who are doing organizing efforts, I think that's part of the way that we do it. Very good. Thank you, Alana. <clears throat> Thank you for uplifting uh, women. And, you know, we know the system is rigged and racist, uh, but we do not lose hope. Uh, we, we've seen uh, our power um, the change and 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 uh, motivate how things happen and occur, and we we can do it again. Yes. So I want to mention a couple of things that have just are don't require a real answer, but a couple of things are one that the Bessie Board is up for re-election this year. Keep that in mind when we're talking about education. 
Um, the uh, several people would like to see the um, Professor Bell's, uh, I guess his talk at the symposium recorded if possible and then sent out or put on our, maybe put on our newsletter thread this time. Is that possible, Lana? Alana, see on mute. We're yes, I am. Uh, say that one more time. I just want to understand what the what the request is. Yeah, that um, that Professor Bell, who is going to be speaking at a symposium, um, he's please ask no, Professor Bell to live stream yeah. the symposium for the. Um, I think that's related to the April the fourteenth, uh, Alana, that you where you were speaking at Southern. Okay, yeah, I I am not certain if we're gonna be able to have it live streamed. I think we're working on that. Maybe Chris can give a little bit more information. I was about to say the same thing. We're, we're working to figure out whether we have the technological capabilities, but if we can, we absolutely will. If, you, right. can, if you can't live stream it, could you at least record it so that we can, we can watch it soon after? Yes. All right, that thank you. That would be great. And, um, question or, or comment we gotta wrap it up yes um let's see oh sorry that's, that's right. okay i know there was a lot of comments and there people... were a lot of comments it's great I'm so <laughs> a lot of good dialogue in the chat so um I think the next, the main thing next is that CC has a um, has an announcement to make about hers, but we could do that at the very end. I think we're, yeah. I think we're kind of run through the most of them. Good, good. Let, let me then give uh, both Alana and then uh, Chris and then uh, Deborah an opportunity to give any closing remarks in about. Um, if you keep it to about two minutes, that'd be great. Uh, let's go with Deborah. Uh, you, you still there? Yes. Yes, I'm here. All right. You want to mm -hmm. leave us with anything uh, as, as we go? Food for thought is uh, around the state of Louisiana, we have so many small, small cities, it's much smaller than New Orleans, that don't have the problems we have. So whenever our bills get on the ballot, it's hard for them to vote for it or against it because they're not that familiar with it and what's going on in the city of New Orleans. So we've got to keep that in mind. And I don't know what we can do to educate across the board other than keep talking to different organizations and networking, but that's a problem. Um, the only other thing I want to say is please join our conference call Wednesday. 10 a.m., 504-294-4472. You'll learn a lot if you just come on the call. Very good. And, and get involved in a community voice as well, too, right? Just uh, please, know, please, please. Yeah. How do we we're we're meeting every Thursday, um, 6:30. We have an Uber conference number that I don't have at hand, but give our office a call at 504. I'm trying to see if I even have the number written down. 710. Beth, can you help me with that? I'm not at my house, I'm at another location. Uh -huh. four. four. Two eight four four. Correct. Yeah, five zero four seven one zero two eight four four. That's every day. What time? Thursday six thirty. Six thir Thursday at six thirty. Yes, uh, please join us. All right. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate you being here, uh, Miss Deborah. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Chris, you want to leave us with any closing remarks? Mainly, I wanted to say thank you. 
um, you know, we're, uh, for all the reasons we talked about, they were, we're going to be fighting to stem the tide against the worst of the fear-based reactionary legislation this year. But I also want to say we're in it for the long haul. Um, in addition to the big elections for governor and attorney general and things like that later this year, every member of the legislature is up for re-election too. And that means we're going to be looking at a whole new composition of the body in 2024. We have the same fights and same debates again with some new, new folks. So if, if we're going to be in it for the long haul and keep uh, having this, this struggle in the right direction, it's going to take conversations like this and groups like yours. And I just want to say thank you for doing this and including us. Thank you, Chris. We appreciate all your work and thanks for being here tonight. All right, Alana. I think Chris said it beautifully. Um, we are your partners. Uh, we seek to be uh, in close relationship with you to provide you with the best evidence, research, arguments, and um, reasoning behind uh, you know some of the really important kind of you know topics that we've been talking about here tonight. Um, you all are a very courageous group. I know several of you individually. Uh, and you have already kind of done some phenomenal things in your community. And we would just ask for you to just continue to stay close to the work of the ACLU and also of some of our partner organizations, um, Legal Defense Fund, NAACP, the Urban League, um, Power Coalition, and others who are doing really amazing work so that we can stay organized. Because I think with the courts being as challenging of an environment as they are and the legislature being uh, as hostile of an environment as it is, I think the power of the people it is one that has to be augmented. And, and I really think you know these kinds of, of meetings and gatherings and kind of coalition building together is what is going to help stem the tide. So it, you know, thank you again for the invitation and please call on us again and please sign up for our, our emails and please join us as members if you're able to. All right. Thank you, Alana. Thank you for being here. We appreciate all your work and thank you for uh, calling our attention to so many things on tonight. We appreciate you. Um, thank you, Reverend. You're welcome. All right, everybody, we're going to move to some announcements uh, by our participants tonight. If you have an announcement that we need to be aware of, an event or an action that we need to show up for, um, uh, please make your voice known at this time. Are there any announcements? Hey, Reverend Manning, uh, it's Cece. Yeah, I'm going to be moderating um, political debates uh, beginning tomorrow from one to three on WBOK, which will talk to the, the same thing you guys just had last week. We're gonna be uh, talking to the criminal district court section A candidates. And then the following day, which is Wednesday from one to three, again, we will be talking to the candidates for the criminal, uh, not criminal, the civil district court race. Okay. So I hope you guys will tune in and ask questions. Very good. And also speaking about what Chris just said, you know, he's right. October 14th, uh, is going to be the gubernatorial primary, but also the Betsy board, uh, the attorney general, the lieutenant governor, and state treasurer elections. So we have to gear up to try to put people in there that understand our issues and will, you know, work toward fairness and justice. And that's all I have to say about that. Right. Thank you. And Alana, let me just highlight Alana and Chris. You know, you guys call me because. Alana knows that, you know, my pen is ever ready with the weekly and think504.com. So call me with some of these uh, important things that you guys are doing. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Lisa, Thank you're you. Gonna, you be okay. You're going to be uh, talking about the, the uh, District 93 race too? You're gonna have Unfortunately, a, a as I understand it from Gerard, no one from District 93 answered the call to come on and talk about their race. So that's what's mm. going on. So that that one would have been today, but mm. since they didn't show, they didn't call. Mm. Uh, so we're not going to be discussing that race. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, um, yeah, we'll have a conversation about that offline. Call <laughs> you. Um, let's. Uh, any more announcements tonight? Anyone else? Uh, I've got one. I've got a couple. Just. Uh, um, 
uh, Broadmoor Community Church and Bethlehem Lutheran Church are one of the first two community lighthouses uh, that are up and running with commercial grade solar panels and battery, uh, battery backup storage installed on our churches as part of the Together New Orleans uh, Community Lighthouse program. We're gonna have our grand opening ribbon cutting on this Saturday at two o'clock. Congressman Troy Carter and uh, several uh, city council members and other city officials will be here to celebrate this historic event. Uh, so that in the event of a widespread power outage in our city, we'll still be able to power up and serve the community. So come out and join us here at Broadmoor. We'll start at two o'clock. Then we'll have a celebration as well, at, as well at Bethlehem Lutheran on Washington Avenue, two o'clock here. Also too, come join and get a good plate of fish for our fish fry at Broadmoor Community Church on March 24th from five to seven. Best fish in town. Come join us. March 24th, Friday at five o'clock. Any other announcements? All right, hearing none, uh, let's go ahead and close. Thank you everybody for joining us. Stay informed, stay encouraged, know that your voice does matter. Uh, and collectively our voices are even bigger and stronger and can do incredible things. So don't give up. Uh, we know the system that we're fighting uh, but we've been doing it a long time and we are we are we are winning and we will continue to win as we continue to fight. Let's close in prayer. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, I'll close us tonight. Uh, if you can just uh, take a moment to breathe, take a moment to realize that um, we have a great network of people and powerful, powerful people on this call and beyond this call um, uh, that can move mountains. Oh, God. Uh, we pray tonight, and as we remember those who have been disenfranchised, marginalized, underserved, uh, God, we we ask that we would uh, invest in, in our community, that you would show uh, those leaders who are in the legislature and those leaders who are not, that, that and those who are uh, in local governments and, and the national, in the national government, the federal government, that you would illustrate to people that, that uh, we have been uh, stuck uh, in a place that uh, it, that that leaves us just connected to the vestiges of America's first sin of enslavement for a long time. Uh, reveal to all of us, to our nation, and to those who are ignorant that the only way to escape uh, is by breaking ourselves free of those vestiges. Remind us, oh God, that. The, the way to begin to rise up is by creating uh, equity and fairness for all people and not just for some. Uh, God, help us to do our part uh, and to never lose hope, but to keep on pushing forward, no matter what pushes back at us. I ask this in the name of Almighty God and my Savior, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. Be safe. Be kind and loving to one another. Continue to fight the good fight. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Thank everyone. You. See y'all tomorrow. Tomorrow, Tuesday, 12 o'clock, we'll have our pillars meeting. Please join us.